How would you like to take the entire didactic portion of medical school in the first year of medical school and spend your third year doing research or pursuing another degree? That's what students at Duke's School of Medicine can do. And we're going to hear from Duke School of Medicine's Associate Dean of Admissions right now. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Acceptance founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 432nd episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for tuning in. Are you ready to apply to your dream medical schools? Are you competitive at your target programs? Accepted's Med School Admissions Calculator can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash medquiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your chances of acceptance. Plus, it's all free. Again, use the calculator at accepted.com slash medquiz to obtain your free assessment. Our guest today is Dr. Linton Yi, Associate Dean for Admissions at Duke University School of Medicine. Dr. Yi earned his bachelor's and MD at the University of Hawaii. He then did his residency in pediatrics at Harbor UCLA Medical Center and a fellowship in pediatric emergency medicine at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. From 1996 to 2007, he practiced and taught pediatric emergency medicine in Hawaii and California before taking a position at Duke University as an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Division of Emergency Medicine, and a pediatric emergency room physician. He is also Duke Medical's Associate Dean for Admissions, and is in that capacity that I have invited him back to Admission Straight Talk for a show devoted, again, to Duke Medical. Dr. Yi, welcome to Admissions Straight Talk. Well, thank you. We appreciate the, uh, the invite. Dr. Yi, can you give an overview of Duke Medical's highly distinctive curriculum? Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we've um, had this curriculum in place for a, a number of years. And the goal is to produce leaders in medicine, but also to help the uh, applicant or and the student uh, eventually understand the, the link between clinical medicine and research and how both of these things help to promote, advance, and improve medical practice. Um, our curriculum is changing again, and we're putting the, you know, the new elements right now in, in terms of what we call a patient first. And, you know, I, I think, I think all the applicants and med students out there have to understand that, you know, that the patient is the center of your universe and everything you do has to be done to improve their well-being. And so we're, we're shifting a lot of our thinking now we're, and actually using immersion of the med students into the, the first year from like day one. So you're, you're seeing patients from day one. And we're then integrating a lot of the biomedical concepts with that. And so, yeah, you, you'll have like, you know, early clinical exposure, you'll have uh, a lot of the foundations within that first year. And so for mm -hmm. us, that first year is still your, uh, your, your basic science year, but with a lot of clinical uh, elements uh, integrated in. The, the second year is still your, your, your clinical year. And then the third year is where we actually have you do research or get an advanced degree. And, and that's where you get a chance to, you know, choose your own direction and get to pursue your, your, your passions. And if you think about it, there are very limited opportunities for you to do that within, you know, all the med schools within the United States. And so, um, you know, this is really a chance to do what you want to do and to, you know, utilize everything that you've done in the past to, to, you know, pursue what you're, you know, passionate about. And uh, so, that's kind of how things are set up over here. It's fascinating. Now, two questions come to mind. If you're having all this early clinical exposure in the first year and also doing the entire didactic portion, which many medical schools take two years to do in one year, how do you cram it all in? I mean, do, you, do they end up starting a little earlier or finishing a little later? I mean, um, no, I, I think we, we try to integrate everything well. Okay. And I, I think you're able to process all of that um, information if you can link everything together. I mean, if you see it, you know, um, you know, if you can link, you know, well, tachycardia, okay, hypotension, or, you know, link it, you know, what's, what's cardiac output, you know, heart rate times stroke volume, right? But then you, you kind of see, well, someone's got tachycardia, their, their stroke volume is, you know, the, the, you know, diminished. I mean, how does, how, how do you adjust this and how do you compensate for, you know, all, all these sort of things in terms of, you know, you using a, a basic formula like that. And, and so I think by integrating all the 
all these elements early on, you can kind of see how everything works together. And, you know, I think, you know, back, you know, when I was in med school, that was part of the frustration of things. It's like, you know, you would just sit there in class and, and you know, read about things, but you would never actually see it. But I think, you know, once, you know, here you get a chance to actually see that in, you know, actually working. And then I think you have a chance to, you know, you, you learn that better and you, you process it um, better. And so it becomes, in, in essence, much easier for you to retain that sort of information and, and integrate it to other concepts. Right. It becomes important to you. Right. As opposed mm-hmm. to just exactly. something academic. Exactly. Now, how has Duke Medical adapted the med school experience in light of COVID restrictions? And what do you think is going to stick around and become permanent as a result of those adaptations? Right. Yeah. COVID led to some significant changes. Um, you know, all the students had to be pulled off the, their clinical rotations. And and so the way they, they did it last year is, um, you know, they made all the didactic part happen when people, when all the students were still limited in their ability to go in the clinical routes. They, so they did that and then they were able to come back onto the, uh, into the clinical realm, you know, after things got, you know, a little bit better. And, and so th- that's how that kind of happened. But I think now we're, we're still trying to like, go back to the way things were and, um, and, you know, but, you know, everyone's got a mask up, uh, you know, you, the students, you know, can't see the COVID positive, you know, patients right now, or I don't, unless that's changed recently, but um, in the past, had, and, you know, and COVID's like almost everybody's testing positive now, as opposed to, you know, yeah. everyone was testing negative of, you know, handful of months ago. And, right. and so this is, you know, almost reminiscent right now of what it was uh, in the um, you know late summer early fall at least for us I mean I, I think for other states that you know it's uh, you know hasn't gone as well um, well as it happens today I attended a funeral on zoom for somebody who passed away from from COVID in Maryland and there was an event that I was supposed to attend this evening uh, in Los Angeles and it was canceled because some of the the parties had COVID exposure they were all healthy fortunately yeah. but you know so it's it's really everywhere Let's turn met to medical school admission. Your secondary application is one of the more thorough and demanding applications. What are you trying to glean from this very comprehensive secondary, other than that the applicant is really interested in Duke or they wouldn't bother to complete the secondary? Right. Yeah. So there's a number of different elements behind this. I mean, you know, one, it's, you know, the, the simplest one is a self screen. If you're willing to put the time into this, you know, if you're interested in Duke that much, you, you'll fill out the, um, the essay. But I think that probably the more important part is. I think all our applicants really have to kind of reflect and understand why they're going into medicine. And I, I, the way the questions are, are, are structured, it's to really get you to examine y- your reasons for this, because, you know, this is a, going to be the, the greatest undertaking you, you've ever done. And, and so you have to be prepared for this and, and hopefully truly understand, you know, why you're embarking on this you know, lifelong journey of uh, service to others and, and committing yourself to doing your, your job in, you know, the highest fashion possible. And, and so, yeah, it's primarily to, to get the students to understand because we, we feel that if the student understands why they're going into medicine, it makes them a better applicant. And it's, it's you know, not necessarily just for us per se, you know, do, but it's for, for every, you know, every school that they would be a better applicant because it, it's just... You, know, you you got to know what you're getting into and, and why, and, and you have to be going into this for the, for the right reasons. And, uh, you know, your, your vision has to be good. And in terms of, you know, how you see yourself, you know, working for others in, in the future. And so that, that's why, you know, things are structured the way they are. It's, it's a very thorough and comprehensive um, secondary. And it, just as, a, as a, a related point to that, somebody we were discussing internally, like, uh, should somebody start their applications with an easy secondary, a shorter secondary, or with a long comprehensive secondary. And I was saying, start with a long one because mm-hmm. it will make you think. And that to your point that this will make you a better medical school applicant. And then you'll have that material to draw from, not to copy and paste, but to draw from and adapt to later applications. Yeah. And the other consultant I was speaking with agreed with me hundred mm-hmm. percent. Yeah, because I think our overall goal, I mean, it's not just getting into Duke or getting into any other place. It's working for, you know, and helping your, your patients in, in the future. I mean, so if we can get all the applicants, by filling out all these essays, and all the applicants understand, you know, why they're going into medicine and work better with it, it's only going to make patient care better, you know, because they're going to, you know, they're going to have, a, you know, they're going to know why they're doing this. And, 
without any, you know, doubts or, or, or questions about, did I choose the right profession or, or something like that? I completely agree with you. What changes, let's get back to the admissions process. And I think, I think again, I, I completely agree that, that by having to think through those questions, which are, are again, they're tough, they're comprehensive, no, it's, it, you are going to be a better physician because you're going to be more aware and, and just have thought through why you want to do this. I don't think any other schools in the United States do this. I, I, there's just one other that has a very comprehensive and lengthy uh, okay. secondary okay. that okay. comes right, right away to mind, but most of them are shorter um, and less comprehensive. I, I think you're right, though, that there might be a service. And just, just to, we were talking a little bit before, and you mentioned that, you know, that your secondary, while it does act as a screen, there's no question that it'll act as a screen, you're still having a, an increase, a very healthy increase in completed secondary applications. And we're recording this interview on August 5th. It'll, it'll air later, but you already have a lot of completed secondary applications, right? Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. We did this podcast, you know, three years ago. At this time, there were 4,330 applications from AMCAS. Right now, there are 6,267 applications. But the even more important part here is that at that time, we had 1,100 completed Duke secondaries. Now we're at 2,155, and this is only 20 days in, into our cycle. That's, that's almost double. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. That's correct. Wow. Whoa. Okay. I'm just making a couple of notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's amazing. All right. Given that, and this is, looks like it's going to be a pretty intensely competitive year, and last year was already a pretty intensive, right. I think you said the 25% increase in applications last year. Right. What process does an application go through when it's marked completed? When you have a completed secondary, mm -hmm. what happens to it? Does it right. go into a so black hole? A, yeah, so it's an, uh, a you know, holistic review. We look through everything. So there's no cutoffs, no nothing. So we're gonna go through the entire application. And what we primarily do though, we, we focus on the essays and the experiences. And that's gonna be the, the key determinant there. And so again, you know, you've got to put something valuable into the essays and you have to have relevant experiences primarily you know clinical research community involvement you know investment in others is where a lot of the key components of, of your application is, is you know that we're going to be you know uh, looking for and when you like when an application is reviewed is it reviewed by three people do you discuss right. applic yeah. applications so, in yeah. committee what's the process yeah so initially it's reviewed by one person and then after that it reviewed by at another level, and then after that, a, another level. And so, yeah, there are a number of people who are gonna go through every one of those applications. Um, so even even an application that, let's say the first person looks at and says, no way this person is getting in, even that application is going to get reviewed by somebody else? That's correct, yes. Okay. Yeah, and in the way, you know, we have our website structured, you know, for the applications, you know, you, you have to click on it, you know, to say that, yeah, you reviewed it. Uh, so we, we know, you know, when it's been done. Okay. And let's say it's reviewed by three people. And I don't know if it's two out of three or all three have to say, we want to interview this person. What, I guess, and they're, they're invited to interview. What yeah, happens it would have then? to be, everyone would have to be in agreement to, to interview. Okay. And they're invited to interview. And what can someone invited to interview at Duke Medical expect from the interview day week, given that everything is virtual right. this year. Yeah. So yeah, this year, yeah, I mean, last year was virtual and it, fortunately you know, our team here is fantastic. And, you know, it took like six months to get of preparation to get it down, but we actually were able to, you know, get everything. So it worked, you know, in an efficient manner. Yeah. So the, the way it's structured is, um, you know, we can only do, well, in the first year, we can only do 10 people a day just because we had to you know, rotate people through rooms. I, I think now we're probably going to be able to do 11, people uh, per, per day. And then on that Sunday evening of the interview week, we always have the, all the people interviewing for that week get together and, and you, and your group within your interview day. So at least you have the opportunity to meet the other people that you're interviewing with. And then during the, that Sunday evening, you know, our students pretty much run that, that evening. And, and so you're going to, you know, have those discuss, you know, what it's like to live in Durham, what the Duke you know, curriculum has to offer and answer any questions that the applicants have. And also, you know, we used to have the research and leadership elements into the actual interview day, but we found that that was 
kind of distracting the applicants from the actual interview process. So we shifted them over to that Sunday. So it really, so now when the, the interviewees come for their actual interview, it's only, you know, you're only there for your, um, your MMI stations. Right. And so, yeah, so the Sunday's got everything together and we try and keep it down to like, you know, just a, a couple hours. So, you know, it's not, you know, blasting the entire evening. And then when they're actually here for the interview, they're roughly here for, I mean, probably need, they need to kind of check in like around 1230 ish just to make sure the connections are, are good and everything. And then hopefully, you know, we'll have them out here roughly around 315 ish or so. Okay. And and I understand they're, they're still, you're still doing the MMIs, right? Even That's correct. Virtually. Yes. And how, how do the virtual MMIs work? Okay. Yeah. So we have five stations in which there's like a scenario. And so, you know, that's fairly similar to what we had been doing before when we were in person. And then we have the team station, which, uh, you know, we had to change. We can't use, you know, what we had used before. So now it's more, you know, things that are two dimensional or without giving up too much more information, but, yeah, so it's it's things that you know both of the applicants can can do um, via Zoom, and I think yeah our again our our team here was really creative in in um, figuring out how to do that, and then we still have the two traditional interview stations which we had had in the past, and then and that would be the, the two traditional ones would just be one on one. Right, right. With, with, within just the same time period of of the actual MMI station, so r- okay. roughly about ten minutes. And then this year we created something new in which we had a, um, a video station in which the applicants would need to observe the interaction of the two medical students and, and kind of like assess what was going on and then offer a solution and, and ob- you know, an observation as to how they might remedy that situation. Okay. And um, if travel, we hope that at some point in time, you know, COVID will be in the rear view mirror and travel restrictions will ease. At that point in time, do you see Duke Medical returning to in-person interviews or some in-person, some virtual? What, what do you what Yeah, do you that's see happening? an excellent question. And I think a, a lot of schools are, are facing that as well. Uh, yeah. I, I think, you know, on, on the plus side for the applicants, interviewing virtually, uh, there's limited, there's no, there's no cost. The impact on your finances is limited. You don't have to worry about airports and, and weather. You don't have to worry about getting to the airport with, with traffic. You don't have to pay for to stay overnight at a hotel or those sort of things. But on, on the flip side, I think, you know, a lot of schools miss the interaction with the applicants and being able to, you know, have our students talk with the applicants and, and get a chance to, you know, show what the facilities look like and, and actually, you know, kind of also talk to the, you know, the applicants about what it's like to live in your, in your city. So yeah, there's two different yeah, pluses and minuses there, but I, I don't think we can go to a hybrid model because uh, it would be hard to differentiate. Well, is there an advantage or disadvantage to doing it in person versus virtual and, and are you being evaluated within the same manner if you're doing it, you know, virtually versus uh, in, in person. So it, it would need to be, one, one or the other. And I, I think if, if a lot of schools you know, are going to opt into going back into person, that I think most schools would probably end up going you know, back to in-person. Because I, I think this year, almost everybody opted in to go virtually uh, just to make things you know, consistent. Okay. No, I know most schools are virtual this year, not all. Right. But um, what are some of the common mistakes you see applicants making either on the secondary or in their interview? Right. Yeah. Excellent question. Yeah, a lot of times they um, they talk more about themselves rather than what they learn from other people and uh, you know what they've gained from their interaction with other people. You know, for instance, like you know, we have the, the the disappointment question, right? I mean, a lot of times people will write you know that they got a B minus in class or you know didn't do as well in the MCAT as they they thought they would. You know, but I I would think that there's maybe more that they could have talked about in terms of that sort of things. You know, in first, we like to look for patient interactions. And I think, I may have, you know, talked about this at the at three years ago and stuff, but, you know, a lot of this, like some of the better essays have been, for instance, like in hospice, what the, you know, the student actually learned from the, the patient that they were paired with about going through, um, you know, the latter stages of life and, and you know, and, and exiting gracefully and, and how they got a, a chance to really appreciate the, you know, the, the power of the human spirit and, and those sort of things that that's you know 
that's the kind of stuff we would prefer to read about and, and, and see that, you know, the applicant has a really good understanding of why they're in medicine and, and how to deal with people and, you know, communication skills and, you know, developing relationships. And, Something more serious than a B minus. Right. And then, you know, and we have the advocacy one as well, because, you know, as physicians, they're going to always need to, they're going to need to stand up for people who don't have a voice. And, you know, and I think we realized this long ago, because, you know, we've had that essay in there, um, you know, for so long that it's, you know, really important for them to kind of tell us, you know, what they did and how they did it. And, you know, and for example, you know, this is one of the, you know, the plastic surgery residents who's here now, and I think he's probably in his fifth or sixth year. I mean, he wrote one of the, the one of the best advocacy essays of probably within the last 10 years, uh, it would be my opinion, but, you know, it's how he stood up for, you know, someone who was being, you know, bullied and, and picked on and, and by this popular person. And, and so he put himself at risk by intervening and, and stopping this. And, but the, everybody respected him enough that they stopped doing that. And wow. I mean, and the, and the way he wrote it was, you know, very eloquently and, and well put. And, and you look at what, you know, what he's done today, he's just, you know, fantastic resident and, and person and he's right. you know, going, you know, right. doing great things. And, and so, you know, so yeah, it's that sort of stuff is what we want to kind of see in essays because you're just following, you know, with that one resident longitudinally, you know, we can see what he's turned out to be. And it's just, yeah, you, you, know, you saw, you saw the character through that essay right, basically. Exactly. And, and he, and he, and he really lived up to it. Yep. Or even exceeded what we thought he would. Right. Be. Right. I think when, you know, a student does write about the B minus or something that's in the larger scheme of things and in, in the, in the medical scheme of things where you are dealing with life and death, it shows a, a lack of judgment, really mm -hmm. lack of maturity, lack of life experience. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that would be, and, and again, you have these other people writing about things that are, are more profound or, or, or taking a more profound perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's a great point that, that you're bringing up. Yeah. And then, you know, that's, you know, again, why the, the essays are, 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 are put there. So that, you know, people can actually reflect upon these things. Now, you know, right. I, I think, you know, you could write about your being nice and maybe you didn't get into med school or that sort of thing, but it's like, it would make a really good essay if you told us, you know, well, I realized I had these sort of things I needed to work on and I took all that advice to heart and, and really made a concerted effort to improve upon all those things. And then this is what I've gained from that setback. And there are ways of, you know, making things right. improving on just, you know, a simple concept of, you know, just getting, not getting a good grade. Right. Absolutely. Does Duke consider letters of intent and update letters? And if it does, at what phase of the process? Because I'm not hearing it yet, mm -hmm. but I know that in a month or two, at most, I'm going to start getting letters, uh, calls. I haven't heard yet. I haven't heard from any of the schools. Oh, should yeah. I should I assume I'm rejected? Mm -hmm. Should I send in a letter of update? If if I'm talking to a dupe applicant, what would you say? Yeah. So the the, the update letters um, are okay. Um, the, the letters of intent, I've I don't know, I, I've been kind of skeptical about because yeah. having done this for so long, you know, there's been people that said I'm coming to Duke 100, percent et cetera, et cetera, yeah. right? And they end up going somewhere else, and, and it's not just you know one person. With those, I, I kind of like. I mean, that's fine, but when it comes down to April 30th is really what I, I, I care about. You know, are you committing here or, or, or not? But yeah, uh, updates are always, you know, helpful, especially if like a paper's been published or you, you've, you've done something else that's, you know, been significant. Okay, great. That's good to know. How do you look at candidates who have faced mental health issues in the past? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. And I, and I think also uh, by the same token, a lot of candidates have been more open about discussing this as well. Yeah. And so, you know, we put a high emphasis on, uh, you know, student well-being. And I, I think by addressing this in the essays, it actually, I think, would help the application because, you know, you're, you're showing that you understand what you did and you actually sought out help. Because I think a lot of times people aren't seeking out help and then it, it just becomes worse. But this shows that, you know, you, you, you sought help and you were able to recover for it. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, grit, resilience being able to take your, your problem and, and face it and move on from it. You know, mental health, uh, you know, emotional aspect, um, you know, is, is really important in, in terms of our, our student body. And, and so if, if people have faced that problem and then have, you know, grown from it and recovered from it, I, I think it's, it's totally fine. All right. Different kind of issue that sometimes uh, really concerns applicants is what if 
they had an academic infraction or even misdemeanors on a criminal record or, or some kind of criminal record. Right. Does that automatically sync their application at Duke? No, not necessarily, but it would be what you, again, learn from it. You know, it's like, for instance, you know, some people would be cited for, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of times it's the alcohol issue. Right. Right. And then, but you see repetitive offenses for it. Then it's like, well, did you learn from the first time? But then right. you see someone maybe a, who had an alcohol issue, but then they did something with drunk driving and, and helping reduce alcohol and abuse on, on campus. Then that's a, a, a different, you know, sort of, a, you know, concept there. Right. Um, Very different. Yeah. And then they, the academic issues, um, you know, again, it's what you gain from it and how you explain it. You know, I think a lot of times it been, I guess, some passages that they got cited for incorrectly. And, you know, I'm not all that familiar with the undergraduate system as, you know, how they find these, but, um, you know, it's again, what you kind of gain from that. And, and, you know, did you recognize that you made an error and did you, um, you know, make amends for that error and, and have you, you know, grown and matured from that? Right. And not made similar errors since. Mm-hmm. Correct. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Right. Now this, as I, I think I mentioned a minute ago, this show is scheduled to air in late August. It's now August 5th. Would you advise applicants who have not submitted their primary application by late August to use the next year to strengthen their application and apply in 2022? Or do they still have a shot? Yeah, I would think that they still have a, an opportunity to be interviewed here. You got to get things in earlier rather than later. I mean, if you're submitting your your secondary on November 15th, we may only have speculating. Maybe there's only like 25 interview spots open on you know November 15th. I mean, right. you would have to done something super spectacular to have gotten one one of those right. versus you know if it's you submitted on August 15th and we still have like you know a few hundred. Right. Get everything in in as early as possible. And somewhat related to to these questions, when should applicants who have submitted their secondaries and not heard from you, secondary to Duke specifically, assume that they're not going to be invited to interview? I mean, the site says that qualified applicants are invited to interview starting late August and all the way into early January. Mm -hmm. But I assume that the numbers kind of trail off at the the end of that period. Right. But, you know, there are always, you know, some last minute cancellations. And so I, I would say that if you're not interviewed by our last day, especially if we're using the virtual world, right. then you, you probably wouldn't be invited. But in theory, you know, if somebody cancels on the last day, we can call someone to interview, to and take that work. interview spot, you know, because yeah. it's, we're not involving you with, you know, the plane fare and, and all that sort of thing. You know, it'd be a little bit more problematic, you know, if, you know, someone canceled on the last day and, you know, we're asking you to fly from California to here, probably the flight's going to be like an over a thousand dollars or more yeah, yeah, yeah. for a, yeah. a, a chance that may or may not happen. We don't necessarily want to put the applicant under that sort of, sort of conditions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I would say that, yeah, if you don't hear from us by the last day we we're scheduled to interview, then, you know, we probably wouldn't be interviewed, but if it's still, it's the day before, then you could still be contacted. Okay. Great. Good to know. Now, on a forward-looking note, what advice would you give medical school wannabes planning to apply to Duke in 2022 for a 2023 matriculation? In other words, they're not applying this cycle. They're mm-hmm. applying next cycle or mm-hmm. maybe even the cycle after. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of it, you know, what, what we talked about in the previous one, you know, they always, you know, broaden your horizons, become invested in your community, you know, get as much clinical experience as, as possible make an impact beyond your, your, yourselves. I mean, that's probably the, the most important part there. I mean, show that uh, you can work with people, you, that you like people, you can develop relationships, you know, and always kind of remember, you know, there's a unique story behind each patient. And it's your goal as a student um, to learn about that story and become invested in it and, and show that person that you, you truly care about what they do and, and who they are and, you know. Right. Um, when my mother-in-law was, was ill, the nurses asked us to bring in some pictures of her with the, you know, the kids and grandkids mm-hmm. so that they could kind of see her in a, in a healthy time. Mm-hmm. Right. And, um, and we did, but I think that kind of gets to what you were talking about. They wanted to, mm-hmm. to see her, not just as the sick patient in front of them, but mm-hmm. as a mother and a grandmother, and mm-hmm. she was a teacher also, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, kind of at least get some impression of her as, as a healthy, vital human being. 
I think that's that's part of what you're talking about. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, because love is, is it's the um, the beauty of working with people and understanding people and uh, getting to to know people. It's you know again relationships, communication, bonding with the people that you're you're, you're taking care of. I mean, and I think you know, your patients will become invested in what you have to say to them if you, they know that you're committed to, you know, 100 percent to making sure that whatever conditions they're facing, you're, you're going to try and remedy. Right. Is there any question you would have liked me to ask you? I think we're probably OK. Yeah, OK. Think, so I mean, you want to add about Duke Medical? Um, well, I, I think, you know, we've always tried to improve the well-being of, of all the people that we we take care of. And, you know, we've tried to address the increasing access to care, fix inequities within the system, we're trying to make, you know, patient care better. And we're always going to need to improve upon that. But I think, you know, Duke has really tried to make tremendous strides in, in making this happen on a, on a regular basis. Um, I, I think for, you know, the applicants and, and for med students, you just take, you know, things, you know, day by day. I mean, this is a, a long haul that you're, you're, you're going through here. And, and if you just kind of, you know, look at, you know, for if you're a med student, just make it so that you're a better med student day by day, you know, just, and eventually after 365 days, you'll see, you know, in one year, it's like, wow, I am a better med student than I was when I first started. And probably the same for, you know, the applicants. I mean, just make it a simple task that, you know, each day you're going to become a better, better med school applicant, you know, just do something, but, you know, each day you're going to, be, you're going to do something, make your, your, you know, your application better. And it can only, you know, help the people that you're, you're, you're working with and, and the people that you're going to be taking care of. You know what? That's a wonderful note to end on. So okay. Dr. Yi, I want to thank you so much. This has been a pleasure as, as it was three years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining me today. We're going to include links in the show notes at exhibit.com slash 432 to Duke School of Medicine, as well as to other resources that may be helpful to you listeners. Listener, thank you too for joining us for our 432nd episode. If you find the show worthwhile, please subscribe. Make sure you don't miss any future shows, be they with deans, admissions directors, professors, current students, test prep pros, or alumni doing great things. And final quick reminder, don't miss the med school admissions quiz. Find out if you are really ready to apply and competitive at your target schools. Take the quiz at accepted.com slash medquiz today. This is Admissions Straight Talk, produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. 